Um, so our next speaker is Tony Lynn Morelli, and she is uh, coming to us from the N Northeast Climate Adaptation Science Center, where she is a research ecologist. Um, and she will be talking some more about uh, these rain shifter species. And I'm going to let Tony Lynn take it away from here. Thanks, Emily. Yeah, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, this is, yeah, it's great fun. We didn't actually think about Inauguration Day when we planned this symposium, but um, I just got a new boss a couple hours ago. Um, and I'm thinking a lot about what we're gonna be doing over the next four years. So interesting times and I'm glad to be touching off with it with this community. Um, I'm Tony Limarelli. I work for USGS at the Northeast Climate Adaptation Science Center. And the work I'm gonna be talking about today is work that came out of both the risk leadership community as well as a community of researchers uh, with a co-author on this work, Piper Wallingford. Um, yeah. So for my talk today, I will be covering these items, um, talking a little bit about climate change, how we expect species to move in response, and um, the focus that's been um, sort of a maybe a rift or uh, maybe just a lack of communication among the community of climate adaptation and the community of invasion ecology and trying to bring those together. Uh, so thinking about actually the implications of rain shifters in a different way. And um, I'll just note that uh, Emily said this at the opening of the session, but uh, we really found this topic was driven in part from your interest in it. And so um, it was in part your, uh, this community's sort of motivation that um, caused these papers and these tools to be produced. Uh, so just a quick overview about um, how climate change is happening in um, the U.S. and globally. There's uh, some, this is a nice graphic from the National Climate Assessment. Uh, and to get into a couple of those, we know that temperatures are increasing. This is um, both kind of average annual and then as Matt talks, spoke so clearly about thinking about minimum temperatures in winter, for example, having some of the biggest changes. And we expect those changes to um, continue into the future. This is from the most recent IPCC report, but the next one will be coming out in fall. And looking at how um, these changes, these increases in temperature are expected into the future, as well as changes in average precipitation, um, which I'll come back to. We also have more frequent extremes. So this, in this case, um, looking at extreme heat which is, although it's maybe we don't live in the purple space, we actually are going to see a lot of um, surprising changes in our temperatures in summer. Um, and then as I alluded to, especially in this Northeastern region where many of us are, we're getting uh, especially wetter and um, in particular seasons. And although it is snowing a bit out my window today, we tend to get more and more rain um, rather than snow. So you can see that um, those heavy precipitation events here, pictured here. Um, and those are expected, this is all observed here, um, these events, this is expected to continue into the future. You can imagine, as I'll mention in a minute, that this uh, could increase uh, the invasibility of our region or um, of a lot of areas in North America. But in general, it means that the climate niche, this area that a uh, species has of the temperature and precipitation conditions that a species has evolved in is shifting. And um, in response, we expect species to move, adapt, or die um, to simplify things. Uh, to think about that um, and build on what Matt was talking about, we uh, expect that invasive species will respond by, um, at least some, by shifting their ranges. So this is work from Jenica Allen and Bethany Bradley Riskers that um, was published about five years ago now, showing how um, the upper Midwest and the Northeast are particularly uh, highlighted as invasion hotspots, places where there should there is likely to be a huge increase in invasive plants in particular into the future. 
And this is essentially just a response of species moving from south to north as temperatures get uh, more benign, as um, was talked about in the previous talk in terms of both minimum temperatures and other conditions. So here's an example uh, from Jonica Allen's work looking at giant reed. So here from EdMaps is a map showing in green where the species, this invasive species is currently located. Uh, Rondodonax, and then we can look to the future and say, um, again, uh, based on Alan's project, Jenica's projections, where we expect it to be in the future. And the deeper green, the more model agreement. This, these are all um, data that you can play with on EdMaps. Um, they're available to work with. And our, I believe there's a hundred uh, species that are projected in this way. And so you can think of this difference as sort of species range shifts in response to climate change. Those are thinking about invasive species. We also have a prediction that native range shifts will change for the same reason. This is a figure showing on the left um, latitudinal shifts and on the right elevational shifts. And it's just an example um, to, sh to make this point of shifting, but it is interesting to note that um, at least 10 years ago that the shifts in latitude um, were seeming to kind of match the predictions. This is this line is observed and uh, matching expected. Whereas the shifts for elevations were, there were very um, few observed elevational shifts that were what the, uh, that matched the predictions. Of course, these species range shifts have all kinds of implications um, in terms of human well being, ecosystem health, climate feedbacks, all of the evolved interactions among species and across uh, com natural communities, as well as ecosystem services, and on and on. Um, and this is usually how we think of uh, the issue of species range shifts in the climate adaptation world is to think this is a problem we need to solve. And um, enabling species to be able to shift to track their climate is something that has been considered a, a major goal for at climate adaptation in that in the, for the three choices of that move or die, uh, we prefer not the third option. And um, the first one is a little complicated. And so there's often this focus on move. This is just a little, um, image from Hampshire College of the Pioneer Valley in Western Massachusetts, where uh, Northeast Risk is based at the University of Massachusetts. And I just wanted to kind of put a, a visual to the idea of um, imagining a species having to move across a landscape. Many of our landscapes are fragmented across uh, the world. So you could imagine uh, whether you're a tree or a squirrel uh, trying to get across this landscape um, is challenging. And so it has been a focus of conservation to try to increase connectivity in order to allow species to track their climate change. And there are many, many, many papers on this. This is just a few to kind of highlight the idea that this has been a major focus. So that's from that sort of conservation side, thinking about how to enable range shifting. Uh, and thinking about the implications of range shifting species uh, primarily is a good thing. And here, just to define range shifting species is a non-native species that changes its range. So expands out of its historical native range to nearby communities to track its environmental niche due to climate change. So on the left here, we kind of have uh, thinking about conservation is usually what the climate adaptation community um, is based in. And on the right, we have a whole different mindset, um, which is focused on managing species as they shift around. And you heard that from Matt in the last talk, uh, this idea of what can we do as, as new invasives move in. And I think actually Southern Pine Beetle is a really good example to kind of try to bring these two paradigms together. So Matt told us all about Southern Pine Beetle, how problematic it is. And he highlighted this work from um, Corey Lesk and Bradley Horton and others that came out a few years back, which projected um, essentially the distribution of southern pine beetle um, up across North America as minimum um, winter temperatures 
increase. So you can see this is a huge problem and managers across the Eastern US are thinking a lot about this um, in New Jersey, in New York, in Massachusetts and up and up, um, worrying about what to do about managing for this species. This is a native species though. So it's interesting because the, in this case, and maybe in the case of forest pests in general, and sort of, um, and then maybe the name says it all, we tend to think about how we can manage these implications and we don't think as much about uh, conservation connotations. So I just wanted to bring up another example that is maybe a little uh, farther from people's comfort zone, but um, I do a lot about thinking about moose as maybe Carrie alluded to earlier. And uh, moose is a species in uh, the upper Midwest and in the Northeastern US that has been met with a lot of conservation challenges lately. And it's of a huge management concern for state and federal agencies thinking about how moose populations have been hit by in particular uh, issues with pests, with insects and disease um, problems and parasite and disease problems. And this is in part because the white-tailed deer are expanding their range into uh, the moose range as temperatures warm and winters become less severe. And as, um, as well as other reasons why uh, deer are expanding. So as deer expand into the moose distribution, uh, these parasites that uh, don't affect deer as much become a big problem for moose. So uh, to make a complicated story simple, in deer expanding their range, moose are having taking a population hit. So we can think of this as kind of a problematic range expansion. Um, but interestingly, you can see from this figure that we have highlighted another part of North America, and that um, shows where moose are, moose are big, and that's sort of like a larger population, and showing that they're doing better. And in fact, moose are ex expanding um, here uh, in Alaska and in this region to the detriment, potentially, of caribou uh, that are... Uh, inhabiting a different ecosystem up there and potentially can have um, be the recipient of negative interactions. So this is just a little story to show that not only are things complicated when we think about the impacts of um, range shifting, but also it really matters even within a species what kind of part of its range we're looking at. So we and this um, effort are proposing that we we get together, invasion ecologists and those thinking about climate adaptation and conservation and kind of come together and think about, think about range shifting species as whether they're high risk or low risk of impacts. And I wanted to walk you through some of the ways in which we've been thinking about this. So we have divided up um, some attributes that you could then kind of go through and think about um, ticking off whether a species is or is not um, fall into these buckets and um, signify high or low risk. So you can see them here. Um, under propagule or dispersal pressure, um, you can note that if a species has high fecundity or wide dispersal or continuous propagules or high genetic diversity, you might think it might have a higher risk of impacting uh, the recipient community than when it's going in, it's shifting into. Um, with the opposite being low risk. And you can see the abiotic facts, effects and of history of disturbance, increasing environmental stress, breach of biogeographic barriers, all these things could lead to a high risk if it's coming from that community um, for the recipient community. And then there's biotic characteristics as well. So we can take these, we can analyze species for these traits and um, then label them as higher or lower risk as range shifters. So for example, you can think of, uh, so one little um, uh, pictorial example here, we have in gray, uh, um, the community that is shifting of these kind of blue and green birds, and it's shifting into this, uh, uh, recipient community here in this black circle of these green and black birds. And um, 
we would label the impacts of these uh, this shift as here. So minimal would be if you end up with sort of all the species still together, so you've increased your biodiversity or your species diversity. Uh, maybe you had a little bit of loss, but not much. Mo all the way moderate to major, where you actually um, might have a loss of a species to a massive shift. And these categories come from the Environmental Impact Classification of Alien Taxa, ICAT, um, which is uh, IUCN sanctioned tool to kind of um, go through the process of um, binning different species on their impact according from massive to minimal. So you can see that here. So all of this is sort of uh, fairly high level and pretty complicated. And um, what we wanted to do is to take that information and bring it uh, more relevant and more actionable uh, for our risk community. And so on the left here is a paper that we published in Nature Climate Change on this topic. And um, on the right is a management challenge. So you've heard about our management challenges. We do several of them a year. You can find them at our website. This is one of our more recent ones. And um, we, as you saw, labeled it nuisance neonatives. So thinking about these species that are they're not non-native, so they're not these traditional invasive species. Um, and so as these natives shift around and track their climate, which is the on, essentially the only way that species are going to persist into the future, are there ones that in particular we want to focus management on? And so to do, to, to answer that question, we have a flowchart here. And so this is again on the management challenge, thinking about how would you go about figuring out what to do about rain shifters? Uh, we took this on because it felt like this seems like a really big thing. First of all, uh, everything's gonna, like I said, um, pretty much everything's gonna shift, you know? Um, maybe things will be able to adapt in place to a point, uh, but unlikely that that will happen for kind of a long term. And so it, this is um, how do we kind of go through a process of prioritizing which species are actually problematic that would be, be worth managing and right to manage. So first question here is, you know, you survey for arrival of new species. So just as you're out there surveying for other invasives that are on your checklist, you might be just looking out to see if a new thing has arrived that is unfamiliar. And if not, then, you know, just keep it in mind for the next survey. But if yes, then you go on to, to think about the traits. And so we've already talked about the, some of these, what risky traits, they've, we summarize them here in just like a more compact form. This is a, um, a shorter list of the things that I already went through. And we list here black locusts as an example. So it's, um, a native tree uh, from the Appalachian re region that's expanding due to, due to climate change. Uh, because it's a nitrogen fixer, it might um, promote other invasive species. And it, uh, the ornamental trade indeed spreads the species in and beyond its native range. Also, um, another kind of red flag is that outside the US, it acts, uh, has invasive traits, impacts. So if you end up with some of these, uh, your, your neonative that you found on your site um, exhibit some of these risky traits, then um, you would go on to 3A here. If not, go ahead and go on to the bottom and just kind of monitor for impacts. I'll come back to that. And so then we wanted to, in our 3A and 3B, uh, just highlight that um, there, we understand there's all kinds of management um, considerations of how easy it is to control things, public support, target species, et cetera. And then also the benefits. So if you can actually um, have an impact and what the impacts would be. So we've um, finally at the bottom, we note that if um, these things aren't true, if this isn't a particularly risky species, then you maybe just kind of keep an eye on it. Um, and if it's really problematic, then you, and you can um, be effective, and um, then you would consider containing and eradicating. So just to summarize, um, implications for this work for conservation and management, um, you can uh, think about prior, prioritizing neonatives based on likelihood of impact to the recipient habitat, 
survey for the expansion of neonatives in your management area, monitor low risk neonatives for impacts and control high risk neonatives when feasible, and then expand, expand public outreach on nuisance neonatives and facilitate discussions on whether management action should be implemented. So you can find our management challenge at risknetwork.org and I would be happy to take questions. All right, thank you, Tony Lynn. Um, so if anybody has any questions and they would like to enter them into the Q&A box, now is a great time to do that. Um, and so we have one question already. So Tony Lynn, the question is, do we know any effects, either positive or negative, on species diversity uh, predicted by overall species shifting? Yes. Okay. Interesting. So I would say from the, so a lot of the work that I do is on the native side. And I think about, you know, I come from that climate adaptation of helping things shift. And we think a lot that uh, we're going to have changes in communities. You know, some, some ecologists and evolutionary biologists argue that community isn't really a thing, at least. Um, beyond a, a narrow point in time. So we think of our communities as very stable. Everything is changing all the time. <laughs> and in reality, over millions of years. So yes, we're going to have changes in diversity. Um, and I would suspect given like we're sitting again at, in Western Mass, we're at the southern edge of like a fairly depauperate uh, uh, eco, eco region you know, the boreal, although it's very special and wonderful, doesn't have a lot of species. And so we could imagine that we are going to be getting, and, and if we look just not too far south of us, it's incredibly diverse in the southeastern U.S. So it's likely that, for example, the northeast region is going to get more diverse um, as a region. But um, thinking about particularly if we have species that come in and dominate, then we might um, be losing uh, rare species, um, poor competitors, more unique species. And so those are things we can look out for. And, you know, um, Matt talked about pitch pine or some other species where these are either endemics or this is sort of their um, stronghold. And so to look out for those. All right, thank you. Um, so our next question is, um, how feasible is it to distinguish between where range shifting species might be actively forcing out a local species versus where the climate and habitat change has just made those local conditions unsuitable for the local species and the range shifter just is moving into uh, just moving into that habitat and taking over that space. Yeah, I think that's really the crux of it. And it's a, I guess, a call for as much as we in this community, in the leadership of risk, really are believe really very strongly in translational science and um, you know applied um, even beyond applied science, there is a lot of need for the basic ecology and evolutionary biology that um, can answer and natural history can that can answer those questions for us. Uh, but you're right. So we need to know more about everything. <laughs> I hope all the students are listening um, because that kind of basic biology will help us understand as something is moving in, is it actually out competing the other thing or is it able to be persist in the new place and the other species is going to be um, lost regardless? It's a really important question. All right. Do we have any more questions? If you have any questions, just type them into the Q&A. Um, Oh, I see another question here. So can we interpret the roles and increased capacity of natural enemies to invasives in the same way as we predict problematic species? Yeah, that's a really good one. So I, I mean, that would be a good question for people that work with natural enemies, but I, sh I would certainly think so because it's not like there's something qualitatively different about natural enemies. They're just the other species that it doesn't happen to be the primary focus. So if we can know about the ecology and behavior of the target species, and we should also study the 
the Calgene behavior of those natural enemies and see and try to predict kind of what their shifts will be. So I think that's a really important piece of that um, puzzle.